Hey guys, Bailey here, and in today's video, we're going to be talking all about when you should cache and how you should cache food for your next backpacking trip or through hike. So I cached food in order to be completely self-sufficient on my San Luis Loop through hike last year, and then I've also gone ahead and cached some food for my CDT through hike this year. And so since I've had a couple people ask how I've done that, I wanted to go ahead and make a video. I'm also hoping this will be helpful just because there really isn't that much information out there about caching specifically for backpacking and through hiking. Most of the information out there on the internet is geared much more towards like doomsday stay prepper and people just leaving them in their backyards. So first things first, when should you cache food? So I'm going to come right out and say that caching food really is not going to be good for most people. There's usually a ton of much better solutions depending on what your trip looks like. So for most people, if you are just going for a short trip, then you don't need any sort of resupply, right? If you are through hiking or doing a longer backpacking trip, then really either mailing yourself food in a resupply box, buying food in town, or even possibly having friends or family meet you at like a trailhead and bring you your food or resupplies are all much easier logistically for a ton of reasons. So really the problem with caching food is that you need to do a lot more planning than you would even for normal resupply mail to a post office or even having a family member meet you and it's much more time consuming. Sometimes when you might want to consider caching your own food would be if you are doing something where you're trying to be self-sufficient. So last year, because of COVID, my goal was to create a trip where I basically wouldn't need to hitch into town or go into any towns to resupply. And because I didn't really have a lot of family in the state that could meet me or a lot of friends, it just made more sense for me to resupply myself by placing food caches. The other pro to food caches for someone like me with dogs is that it can shorten some of your carries in places where it would be otherwise difficult to access a town. So my dogs eat two and a half pounds of food every day when we're through hiking, which is really heavy. And so if I can cut a seven day carry in half, then that makes it much easier on me and on my gear to be able to support my dogs just because Prima does not carry her own foods on long distance hikes. And that is what I've gone ahead and done this year. That's why I'm caching on the CDT is just to cut down some of our resupply distances for the beginning of our trip. So sometimes you might do all of your resupplies as caches like I did on the sand and loose loop. And sometimes you might do what I'm doing this year where you just supplement your regular resupplies with caches. So another thing I need to highlight real quick before we jump into the how to is that of course the most important thing is to follow leave no trace. So if you choose to cache, then you need to make sure that wherever you put your food caches, that it's legal there. Sometimes you're not allowed to cache in wilderness areas. You also need to make sure that whatever containers you use or method you use, whether it's mine or a different one, is going to make sure that animals can't get into your food. And then lastly, make sure that when you're done, you're gonna go back and pick up all of your cache containers and all of your trash. So, and that is super important and really why caching is not for most people is because not only does it take two or three or more days at the beginning of your trip, to place all of your food caches at these trailheads that are hard to get to, but then when you're done, you also have to go back and pick them all up. Okay, so maybe I've not scared you off or you've decided that this is still for you, or maybe you're just still interested even if you're not gonna use it and want to learn more, but let's go ahead and talk about how to cache food. So first things first, this is just a method that I use. There are other methods out there. I'm gonna talk about some different containers you can use and what I personally use, but just because it works for me doesn't mean it necessarily works for everyone. This is just what I've used and it's worked well so far. But if you have a different method, then definitely you know drop that down in the comments. I will say there is another method that where you can dig holes and bury buckets. A lot of people do this kind of method in the desert. And there is an article that I found on that recently. So if you wanna check that out, I'll put that in the description along with my article that I wrote about my style of caching if you want to see it in blog form. Okay, so step one for caching your own food for a trip would be to identify where you're going to leave your caches. So just like you pick towns that you stop in if you're doing a through hike, you need to pick what trailheads or where you're going to go. And this can be more difficult for some people than others. Personally for me, I drive a front wheel drive, low clearance vehicle. And so there are trailheads that I cannot reach in my car. So I have to be much more careful about where I am dropping off my food. This is easier in an area where you're more familiar with it. So like last year on the San Luis Loop, I was pretty familiar with most of the areas and I kind of knew a lot of the roads and stuff. And so it was easier for me to know ahead of time that I wasn't going to like bottom out my car or get stuck. This year was a bit more interesting, shall we say, because I was definitely in much more of unknown territory. 
And again, keep in mind, check your regulations. If it's wilderness area, sometimes caching is not allowed. So now that you've picked where you're going to go, the next part is creating your resupply. And I'm really not gonna talk a lot about this because it's the same if you're creating some sort of mail drop. So you're gonna get all of your gear and supplies together. The only difference might be if you are trying to be 100% self-sufficient and not going into towns, especially if you're doing like gates to the Arctic or something like that, then definitely you want to include things that you would normally maybe not include in your resupply and just be more careful and pay more attention to what you're putting in there. So last year I was pretty um, fastidious with my record keeping and I really kept track of everything, wrote everything down and made sure to include things like fuel, things like, you know, extra climber salve, extra things that you normally just replace on trails you go, just because I knew that I wouldn't have a chance to buy those when I was out hiking. Of course, this year I knew that my caches, if I didn't have something, I could probably live for another five days or whatever until the next town. So I was not quite as crazy with my record keeping. It was also my second time around, so that made me a little more confident too. Next would be to put it all in a container that you're going to cache. So I personally have been using these ammo cans that were recommended to me. So these are like old military surplus ammo cans. And I really liked them for a couple reasons. After I got those, I ended up finding some information on maybe using cookie tins or paint tins. But I actually am really glad I went with the ammo cans, even though they're slightly more expensive. And that's just because A, they're already camouflage color, which made them easier to hide. I'll talk about that momentarily. And then B, I think they're just also stronger and they have a gasket seal, so they're waterproof. Um, and just overall, they're a much more solid choice and they're going to be able to stand up to the elements much better. You could, of course, also use like a bear can um, that gets really expensive really fast. But if you already have one, you can utilize it. And I definitely did that last year. And then, like I mentioned before, some people use like Home Depot buckets or whatever, but that I would only use if you're planning on burying because that's not going to stand up to a really determined animal. I personally just kind of throw everything in there. I don't use an odor-proof sack because I'm assuming it's going to have the same purpose as a bear can where the container itself is strong enough to keep animals out. And honestly, I've never seen animals mess with any of my ammo cans. And I think part of it is because of that gasket seal that they really are pretty scent proof anyways on their own. So don't worry about that too much. I will say though, that if you are really sensitive to weird tasting food, that I have noticed that repackaged food, like repackaging goldfish or Oreos in like baggies and putting them in the ammo cans, they do kind of taste weird when you eat them after the fact. So maybe keep that in mind if you're kind of picky about that kind of thing. And then along with that, I would also buy some sort of rope, try to get something somewhat strong. And I would also recommend like camouflage or green color because when we go out there, we're going to tie it to trees and that kind of thing. So make sure to buy that before you head out. After I fill my cans, I do a couple of things. The first thing is I label them. So I label them with a note saying what I'm doing in the hopes that hopefully if someone does accidentally stumble across my can, that they will leave it alone. It's nice if you can put an ETA for when you're gonna pick it up again, and then definitely put your name. I put my name and permanent marker on the can itself because I was planning on keeping them, which is good because I am reusing them this year, as well as put a sticker or like duct tape and write on it with where that can is going. That way when you are actually resupplying yourself, you know which can to pull out and put out when you're there and you don't have to like search through your car. Especially if you are doing something where you're there's really a big difference between what's in each can, then this is definitely important. So once you have filled all your cans, you've labeled them, maybe you even wanna add a note on the inside asking people to leave them alone, then the next step is to load them up and take them out. So pro tip, I recommend the loading them in reverse order of where you're going to cash them. This just makes it a lot less stressful once you you know, are putting them out because then you can just pull the ones out of the front. And then you're going to go ahead and drive to all of your trailheads and drop them off. So usually what I do is once I get to the trailhead, I get out the cans I need and I try to walk a little bit up the trailhead away from the parking area and then back into the trees. That way it minimizes the chance of someone accidentally stumbling over my cans. The goal is that nobody even finds them in the first place. So that way hopefully nobody will take them or mess with them or that kind of thing. So usually I look for an area that has good cover that's not always possible, especially if you're in like the desert, but you know, do your best. I try to find like a medium to small-ish tree that's easy to tie the rope around with lots of stuff in the area that I can use to hide my cans. So another pro tip is to look for obvious landmarks when you turn off your trail. That way it's easier to find it when you come back later. So once you've done that and you've found a good spot, I go ahead and nestle them under a tree or a bush if there aren't any trees. And then I take my ropes 
and I tie the rope around the handle of my ammo can and then around the trees. And then I also take a short piece of rope and tie the opening of the can down. That way it just makes it a little bit harder to get into it for an animal. They can't accidentally pop it open. I don't use a lot because I'm not really trying to keep people out. Like a determined person is going to get to it anyways. But it's mostly the rope to keep animals out. Once I have it all nestled and tied to the tree, usually my next step is I go ahead and take either rocks or sticks or dead grass or whatever is in the area that looks natural and I use it to start covering my can. The most important part is to cover the duct tape if it's a different color than your can and then you know you want to make sure the rest of it blends in too depending on what the environment is. Be sure to not use anything live, don't break branches, don't pull up plants or that kind of thing but um, you know you can take rocks, you can take dead sticks, that kind of thing and use it to just help your can kind of blend in. And my goal is that when I step away, it's hard to find even for me. That way someone else is not going to necessarily see it. Now the next thing is a very important step and that is to lay down a waypoint. So personally, I use Gaia GPS a lot anyways. I use that strictly on my trip last year and I'm using it on some of my alternates this year. And so I just go ahead and put a waypoint where my box is. That way if I forget where it is when I'm hiking, it's easy to find it. The nice thing about using Gaia and the waypoints in Gaia is that you can also add notes. So I'll usually put some notes in there about what to look for. And then I also take some pictures of the box and the landscape around it and on the trail and then edit them in the photo app on my iPhone with like the markup feature to show and circle where those are so I can kind of see what it's supposed to look like. Of course, it could look a little bit different when you get there, especially if it's been a little while. So that's why it's nice to have those notes in the waypoint too, but then you can add those pictures and the notes all to that one waypoint and use it to find your cache down the road. I personally have never had a hard time finding any of my caches except one water cache, but it's just nice to have a backup, especially if you're really depending on that cache to go onto your next resupply. So once you've marked where it is, then that's pretty much it. Go back to your car, go to your next caching spot, drop it off, and continue this until you've cached all of your resupplies, and then go out, have a fun trip, right? So hopefully everything should be there. It has been for me in the past. And then don't forget that at the very end, you're going to go around and pick up all of your cash boxes, take them home. I would recommend wiping them out, spraying them out, especially if you put something like dog food in it. Um, that just kind of keeps them clean and keeps them from moldering, that kind of thing. And then from there, you have these new boxes that you can use in the future for your next resupply. So that's pretty much it. It really isn't too difficult, but it is time consuming and is a little bit different. And you do wanna be careful just to make sure that nothing is getting into them. Again, if you have questions, let me know down in the comments. Then if you're interested in getting more tips and tricks all about hiking, backpacking, and through hiking, especially with dogs, then definitely consider subscribing and I'll see you guys next week.